Christ Church Birmingham. We're so glad you're with us. Now, who's ready to worship? fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. The an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shined around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring good news with great joy that will be for all the people.
Aren't you proud of our kids? Let's show them a little bit of love. It takes a lot of courage to get up here. They're going to exit out for us. They're going to head up to Kids Church. In case you don't know, we've been talking to them as they've been getting ready the last few weeks. And this uh, was their gift to Jesus during this Christmas time. Obviously, we know moms and dads and grandparents all enjoy it. But ultimately, we point them to why they're doing this, and that's for Jesus. Because he's the reason for the season. Amen? So while they're uh, stepping off here, we're so proud of them. They've had great attitudes. We're thankful for all those who are able to help for everything we do every week. Uh, in children's ministry and all the ministries at Life Church Birmingham. I want to quickly give you something as we're about to head out here with them. A lot's going on here for young and old the next couple of weeks, as you may know, for the Christmas season. In fact, next week, in case you don't know, if you don't have kids, we want you to know because we want you to have reasons to invite people to the house, right? And what we're doing of all ages. And so we've got this amazing event. We did it last year called the Gingerbread Bash. It's for our kids at three up to sixth grade, and they come in their Christmas pajamas next Sunday, bring them here, and they're going to make their very own uh, nativity, gingerbread nativity, and we'll go over again, reemphasize as they make that. Uh, it'll be a great day. We'll have lots of candy, as you can imagine, for kids, uh, but we'll bring them back focused on why they do it, and they take it home and can eat it for the next week or so. So please do us a favor. Don't just bring your kids, but invite their friends or invite your grandkids or anybody you think that would enjoy that. Help them focus and feel welcome at the house as they learn about the reason for the season. Hey, Pastor Tim. Hey, I, I just want to interrupt you real quick as you give that announcement. And as the worship team comes, um, we were talking earlier in the week about Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. And our Boys and Girls made a commitment to raise $5,000 for missions and we're doing, they're doing amazing so far. Would you give us the total so far on what, we've, what they've raised? Yes, sir. Thank you, Pastor Tim. So we have given more than we've given before and more than last year, which was our highest, $3,514.50. Come on. Yeah, yeah, so we're proud of them already. Yeah. So we know that's going to keep going up. We've got a few more weeks. we got to the end of the year to hit our big goal of 5000 Now, we've made other levels, so we're not trying to talk about them as much as our big goal, but... We have a four thousand dollar goal, Amazing. which if they hit it, I'll turn my ha my hair blue. Already they've crossed the threshold of me eating a goldfish. Yeah, and baby so, goldfish, baby so goldfish. Five thousand for missions gets a haircut like mine, like yours. Oh, Ball. come on! <laughs> me and John Witten, if we somehow get five thousand, because we got to shoot high, we're going ball to look like our lead pastor, Pastor Tim, for Jesus. Ultimately, that's the so big less than fifteen hundred dollars, and we all get to be twins. Come on, <laughs> hey, would you for stand, Christmas? Would you stand together <laughs> as we prepare to worship the Lord? Amen. Come on, put your hands together this morning.
give him praise today. King of kings and Lord of lords, you're worthy, you're worthy. God with us. Smile real big and tell your neighbor, Christmas is good news. Just tell him right now, Christmas is good news. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. You may be seated. Hey, welcome to Life Church Birmingham. Didn't you enjoy those kids? Come on, singing their hearts out. Amazing. Love it. Thank you for all the leaders that helped with that. Well, welcome. If you are here for the first time and I haven't met you yet, my name's Tim, I'm the pastor, and I'm so glad that you came out to worship with us this morning. So hey, thanks for being here, and our hope is that you feel loved and welcome and accepted, because you are, like, we planned on you being here, even though we didn't know it was you, right? We always make room for one more, and so we hope that you feel that. We'd love to connect with you and just kind of hear from you, and the way that we do that um, a lot of times is through our connection card. So I'm going to invite you to reach in the seat back in front of you. 
and grab one of these white connection cards. Grab the pen and take a few moments and fill it out. If you're here for the first time, you can just put your name and check the box that says first time. Maybe you're here uh, for the second, you can indicate that, and there's room for a third time as well. After three, we just say regular attender, so um, welcome. Um, at the end of the service, we'll receive these cards. So take a few moments to fill it out. On the back, there's a place for prayer requests. So if you write it down, we'll be praying for you. As a matter of fact, we'll be praying for you this week. Uh, this Wednesday, we have our last um, Wednesday night prayer meeting of the year. Because it's like we're in the middle of December, you know? And so 645 right here, we invite you to come and be part of that. We'd love to have you. Uh, at the end of the service, there'll be some ushers to receive these. Um, you can see them at the door. You can drop them off with them. Or you can go to the uh, welcome table on the left as you exit. Our hospitality team will be there along with our connection pastor. And so we would love to put a face with the name and meet you. Can we give our guest a warm Life Church welcome this morning? Come on, would you? <clears throat> so glad that you are here. At the end of the service, when we receive the connection card, it's also an opportunity to give. Um, if you're a guest, we don't have an expectation uh, for you to give anything. Uh, but we do set that part of the service aside um, to be able to express to the Lord our thanks and, and give a tithe and offering. And so that's available. You can check out the screen behind me. There are several ways to give, and you can take advantage of that and worship the Lord. Hey, tonight at 5 o'clock, everybody say 5 o'clock. Tonight, 5 o'clock, we're having a family, a Christmas movie night. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to ask you to bring your favorite Christmas snacks, whether it be salty or sweet. And we've got a couple short uh, kids' movie, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. Come on, did you know in 1965, when that, that special was aired for the first time, it shocked the world? That's, the, the video actually tells the gospel story. Did you know that? It tells the gospel story. And what I read this week was when that was shown, half of the viewing audience in the country tuned in to that show that night. So we're going to watch that in another short film called three wise men. We're going to have fun and just fellowship together. So you come at five, come a few minutes early, drop off your uh, 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 snacks, and we'll have popcorn for you as well. You don't want to miss that. Well, today's a special day. Today is a day that we are recognizing um, the accomplishments of a great man. Um, a couple weeks ago, Pastor John and Joni celebrated a 10-year anniversary of being on staff at Life Church Birmingham. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask the hires to come on up. Come on, Hannah. Come on, Joni. Come on. Would you let them know how much you appreciate them? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, like how many have a dog and you're like, hey, in dog years, my dog's actually 86. You never know do that? In youth pastor years, 10 years is a super, super long time. As a matter of fact, it is so uncommon, almost unheard of. But I'm telling you, we've been blessed with the best. We've been blessed with the best. And I appreciate Pastor John and Joni. Um, their flexibility, always trying to learn new things, always trying to grow. And Hannah, we just seen her grow up. She came, she was just a wee little lad, and now she's 10 years older, you know. And so we're so um, um, uh, happy to be able to celebrate with them 10 years of full time ministry here at Life Church Birmingham. I believe. That is the longest tenure of any youth pastor in the 50-year history of the church. I believe that's the case. And so thank you for your longevity, your long-term um, commitment. And um, we want you to know that we love you. Um, there were a few people that couldn't be here but wanted to give you a message. So if you'll pay attention to the screen behind me, there's a few of them that just want to give you a quick message. Good morning. I want to join everybody in congratulating John and Joni Hires for 10 years 
as a part of this wonderful ministry team. So hey, today, let me jump in with the crowd and congratulate you and salute you as being a great example to so many people. Bless you and have a great day. Hey, John, I want to congratulate you and Joni and Hannah for 10 years serving there at Life Church. Congratulations. You guys are such a blessing, not only to that church, but also to churches all across Alabama as you serve on my cabinet on Alabama Youth Ministries. And you are just a gift to so many people and loved by so many people. I've never seen you have a bad day. You always have a smile on your face and willing to do anything I need you to do and able to do anything I ask you to do. It's just amazing. I've never seen anybody like you. You're an amazing gift to the kingdom of God, and we love you all. God bless you. Here's the 10 more years. Hey, John. Hey, Joni. We just want to congratulate you. 10 years. Wow, that's awesome. 10 years in one ministry. That is amazing. That's a legacy. We love you guys. Congratulations, John and Joni, on 10 years at Life Church in Birmingham. Paulette and I love you. We've always been proud of you, but proud of this uh, milestone in your life also. We want to say God bless you. Thank you for your faithfulness. We love you more than you know. Blessings to you on this special day. things after the service we've got a cake and punch reception because why why should you wait for after lunch to eat dessert right um, and we figured you weren't getting enough simple carbohydrates during the holiday season so we want to help you with that we've got a, a punch and cake reception for them in the cafe just swing by and say hello and on behalf of the church pastor john and on behalf of the leadership team we want to say thank you for 10 years of faithfulness hannah you're a great example of just someone who loves Jesus. And that's, that's all we expect. Just be yourself. And you've been wonderful to see grow up. Joni, thank you for standing by his side and leading in your own right the ministries that, that you find opportunity to sometimes even create and then lead those. So thank you. And uh, the leadership team has set aside a gift for you guys. And um, what we want you to do with the gift is buy some furniture, take a trip, um, do whatever you want with it. So we've set that gift aside for you, and you guys can kind of collaborate. And Joni's thinking, I'm going to Mexico. <laughs> a gift set aside on behalf of the church. Congratulations, and we want you to enjoy this and know that we love you and we support you and we thank you. God bless you, my friend. I love you. Love you. Oh, man. Would you give them a hand one more time as they're seated? Thank you, guys. Well, I'm excited about the word. Grab your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. As you do that, make sure you grab one of these. It has all the details of the different Christmas services that we're doing. Isaiah 54. We also had a really neat accomplishment in our church family this week. Uh, Pastor uh, Mike, Pastor Mike graduated from seminary with a Master of Divinity, come on. <laughs> Just a student of the Word, I don't, I don't know if you understand the significance of that. That takes three years if you hammer away full time at it. That's after a four year degree and I think is it four semesters of Greek, four semesters of Hebrew, man just because he wants to just love God and be a student of the word. And so we got to celebrate that. A lot of neat things happening. Well, today I want to do part two of our series called Overcome. And my desire and my hope and my deepest prayer for you is that you would live in the overcoming power of Jesus Christ. That you would live knowing that God has plans and purposes for you. And it's not to live in the past, to be chained to the past, but to move forward in Him in grace. And last week we talked about how to overcome offenses, right? And what we said was, uh, life is too short and our calling's too great to live offended. Come on, we don't have time for that. We've got to move forward. Matthew chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1 and 1 John 3 say this. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. 
the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what Christmas is all about. And 1 John 3 tells us the reason that he came. The reason the Son of God came, the reason the Son of God appeared, and say it with me, was to destroy the devil's work. That's why he came. That's the reason he came. And today I want to talk to you about overcoming shame. Overcoming shame. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4, this is our key scripture today, and here's what it says. Fear not. And we could, we could spend just a few weeks on that, couldn't we? Fear not. You will no longer live in shame. Come on, maybe you did in the past, but you'll no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There's no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth. Shame is a soul crushing, identity warping emotion. Shame is a soul crushing, identity warping emotion. There is a slight difference between guilt and shame. I think it's important to identify the difference. Guilt is an emotion that happens when we feel bad about something that we did bad. Shame is the emotion that comes and says, I am bad. I did something wrong. I did something bad. Therefore, that's my label. That's who I am. That's what shame does. And you know, we tend to live up to the ex expectations we put on ourselves. And when shame covers us, it holds us back. If we can be convinced that we are bad, then guess what direction our life's going to go? And some of you are dealing with that emotion right now. During the Christmas season, the highs are amplified emotionally, and the lows are also amplified emotionally. It's a time of reflection. Some of you are dealing with that right now. There's things in your life that you did that are bad, and the enemy is using that against you to convince you you're a bad person. I did bad, right? Therefore, I am bad. That's what shame does. I did something bad, therefore, I'm a bad person. So we're going to get a little heavy today. <laughs> just as a show of hands, just to go ahead and expose the enemy real quick. How many have ever done something they regret doing? Just show of hands. Show, okay. Now, what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor and tell them what you did. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just don't do that. Turn to your neighbor and ask them what they did. No, don't do that either. <laughs> I want you to take a few notes. Number one, this. Shame is not from God. Shame is not from God. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit, but shame is not from God. Genesis 2.25 is, 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 a, is a fascinating scripture, and it's kind of funny, maybe because I'm immature, I don't know. Um, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. And maybe the 12-year-old boy inside of me kind of giggles when I read that. But it, it's, it's a fascinating scripture. Um, nothing covering, no embarrassment. Complete vulnerability. They felt no shame. Guilt is action-based. Shame is identity-based. Guilt, I did something bad. Shame, I am bad, I am wrong, I, I'm dirty. Uh, shame seeks to um, define you. Guilty of what we did and ashamed of who we are. I don't know if she's a follower of Christ, but she is one of the, some would say, one of the leading um, experts on, on shame. I've seen some of her TED Talks, and Brene Brown, um, did someone with who? Maybe you're Brene, okay, okay. Brene Brown defines shame this way. Here's what she says about shame. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and unworthy of belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do that makes us unworthy 
of connection. Shame will keep you back. I have no idea what causes you to feel shame. I have no idea what causes you to feel shame. But, but what I want to do is take something the enemy would use to really hold us hostage, take the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and shine it on that, show the devil for the toothless, roaring lion that he is, he's trying to devour, but ultimately he has no real power because Jesus has overcome. And I want, to, I want you to think about something for a few moments. Shame-based thinking, how you perceive and how you go about life. Uh, uh, three things real quick about that. Shame-based thinking makes you vulnerable to perfectionism. Now, I have my attention. Because that's what I do. I'm like, I tend to be like that. Um, I count ceiling tiles. I, <laughs> I line stuff up straight. I, I sleep better at night when the closet's closed and the, you know, how many, come on, somebody, I'm flapping out in the wind here. <laughs> but listen, we silence our shame with a perfect performance. I want to cover my shame with a perfect performance, and we attempt to silence with error-free performance, and we find it difficult to admit fault. We want to silence shame by saying, look, I have the highest standard, I'm not a bad person. And shame leads to many times this idea of perfectionism. I did it, I exceeded it, I got it just right. Shame-based thinking is vulnerable. To perfectionism. Shame-based thinking number two becomes critical of ourselves, which drives us to be critical of others. The most critical people around many times are those who are dealing with the most shame. Shamed people shame other people. We become very, very, very hard on ourselves, and that in turn makes us hard on other people. And what happens? We see our faults mirrored in someone else, right? And we become judgmental of them because it's irritating. And then we're perceived as arrogant, self-righteous, and that's why so many times you find an angry person, a critical person, as someone who's dealing with shame because it wants to come out with a critical spirit. And we see many times in that shame-based thinking our own weakness in other people and we hate it. The third thing that shame-based thinking leads to, makes us vulnerable to, is self-defeating thoughts. We, we shield ourselves with self-defeating thoughts because we don't want to be disappointed. We tend to shame-based thinking thinks about the worst-case scenario, right? The worst-case scenario. This is bad. It's going to be really, really bad, and you have no idea how really, really bad it's going to get. It's just going to be super, super bad. Did I tell you it's going to be bad? Someone said it's going to be bad, and I'm telling you it's going to be really, really bad, and we lower expectation so that we're not disappointed, and at the same time, we sabotage relationships. We sabotage peace. We sabotage opportunities. And these self-defeating thoughts are used as a form of like this, um, oddly enough, protection or uh, escape, focusing on the worst possible outcome. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. And we sabotage opportunities. Shame-based thinking uses self-defeating thoughts, it becomes critical, and, and it wants, it leads to, it makes vulnerable perfectionism. If you go back all the way to one of the really foundation gospel stories in the Bible, um, it is the Israelites 
in Egyptian captivity. For 430 years, they were slaves. You remember the story, Joseph um, sold to slavery. He gets, long story short, he's persistent, persistent, consistent, consistent. God elevates him to a position of authority because of his faithfulness and using his gifts, and famine comes. But they've prepared, and now Joseph's brothers come to get food. And so Israel comes to Egypt, and then they kind of never leave. For 430 years, they were slaves. They were subject to Pharaoh. 430 years, and it didn't get better. So after 430 years, you don't know anybody that knows anybody that knew anybody that wasn't slavery. It, it, it becomes a weight, a mindset, a, a heaviness put on a group of people. So Moses comes, um, and... Um, of course, he looks like Charleston Heston. So he comes, and he, he says, let my people go. And um, Pharaoh's like, mm, not, I don't, probably not. Okay, yeah, no, no, I changed my mind. And the plagues come. The tenth plague comes, and they go. They're free. They're, free. They're no longer slaves. Here's what happened. They were free from slavery physically but they weren't free from slavery emotionally in their heart. They didn't know how to live as free people. And you, you look in the Bible, you see um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Why is all that there? It's to help a group of people that have been indoctrinated into a subservient uh, slavery and bondage to teach them how to live in freedom. They're long, longer slaves, but the slavery's not out of them. And that's where some of us are today. Because the shame of our past is holding us back. And the way to heal, the way to heal from shame is to not focus on ourselves, but to focus on who Christ is. Take some of the focus off of me and onto Jesus. Some of you have been forgiven but you're consumed by this shame-based thinking and it, it holds you back. You're believing your things about yourself that God doesn't even believe. The deepest prayer is that Isaiah 54, 4 would be a reality. Fear not, you're no longer to live in shame. Don't be afraid, there's no more disgrace for you. No longer live in the shame of your youth. I want to read that again to you and I want you to eternalize it. Fear not. I want you to picture God saying this to you. As a matter of fact, if it would be helpful to close your eyes, close your eyes and envision this. I'm going to read it to you. Make it personal. God would say, fear not. You will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There's no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth. Why is that? You can open your eyes. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, we can be completely free from our past. Come on, somebody. We can be completely free from our past. 1 John 1, 9 says this about that. Here's the really good news. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins. Do we have it? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So here's the good news. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone. God separates your sins as far as the east is from the west. So I have a question. How far is that? <laughs> it's interesting. When that was written, they didn't know there was kind of technically on the planet a north pole and a south pole, right? So you can separate north and south. Tell me where east begins and west ends. There's no distance he separates us as far as you can imagine. He doesn't hold against you anymore. You are free. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Our good God forgives you and remembers your sin no more. No more. That's what Jesus does. So if God, being good, forgiveness that is real, comes to our life, and why do we sometimes, too often, 
live in shame. Here's the truth. It's very, very difficult to overcome shame because it wants to become part of our identity. This is not a sermon on tattoos, but I've seen some people mark themselves with a history that they're not really proud of. They, 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 it goes deep, it goes deeper. It's like a tattoo on the heart. Shame is not from God. Number two, Jesus destroys the shame that separates us from him. Jesus destroys that. Shame is like a wedge, right? Holds us back. It locks us up. It keeps us from what God has for us. It makes us feel we're not, like we're not worthy of God's love. Uh, shame is like a scarlet letter written on our chest. It causes us to feel unworthy, not loved, not accepted, no plans, no purpose. It robs us from all those things. Shame change you to the past just like the Israelites. This is weird to say, but when they got to the desert to be free, and the first time they hit opposition, you know what the request was? Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to that. And that's what shame does. It wants to return us back and think over and over and over, even over things that have been forgiven. And God says, I really don't even know what you're talking about because we have already dealt with that. Adam and Eve were both naked and they weren't ashamed. I think that's a pretty good definition of paradise. Ultimate paradise, there's no shame in that place. None. None. And then in the next chapter, you could say literally the next day, Genesis 3, 1 says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. Who was it that came to Eve and said, Hey, girl, I got a question for you. When God was talking to you, did he, did he really say what he said? He convinces her to do the only thing that she wasn't supposed to do. You could, all this is yours. Just stay away from that. That's no good. He convinces her. She convinces Adam. They eat forbidden fruit. Sometimes we say it's an apple. Truth is, we don't know what it was. <laughs> In Genesis 3, 8, the 10 says this. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he's walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to them and said, Hey, where are you? And he answered, Adam says, I heard, I heard you in the garden. And um, I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Interesting. Yesterday, you also were naked, and you had no shame. But today, God says, who told you that? I remember uh, about 15, 16 years ago, we lived in Florida before we moved back, and we had a house that was on a corner. It was kind of a long corner. So the backyard was this huge, and the front yard kind of wedged. The, back, the front yard was huge. The backyard kind of wedged. And there's a fence in the driveway that wrapped all the way around the backyard. So the beauty of that is you close the wooden fence and the kids can play in the backyard. And we had a well, which meant free water. Now, 
Um, you could get your daily iron from this water. The clothes would turn yellow and stuff, but they'd play in it, right? So at some point, we got tired of having all the stuff stained, so they just decided it was going to be like a pediatric nudist colony back there. And I'd come home, and there's just these three kids just running around with no clothes on, right? And, and, and as adults, you kind of giggle, right? Because you're, you're thinking, they don't even care. Number one, they don't know, but what they do know, they don't care about. They're just free as can be, just running around. And then once in a while, it's funny, one will sneak out some of your front doors, and, right? And they'll run out in the front yard. No, we got no clothes on. They get funny, and they're running, right? Why is that? No shame. That's what Adam and Eve experienced, and the next day, they're hiding. The next day, they're hiding. And it's interesting that even in, in that moment, God made a pit, a covering for them. An animal was sacrificed to put skins on them. A picture of the sacrificial lamb that would take away the sins of the world and remove all guilt and all shame and destroy it forever. One day, there's no shame, there's complete freedom. The next day, they're hiding from God. God hates shame. God despises shame. Heaven is adamantly opposed to shame. Jesus is warring, interceding even now to remove every bit of shame. Hebrews 12, Hebrews, yeah, 12 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run, come on, everybody say run. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Listen, scorning its shame. That's NIV. If you have ESV, it says, despising its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Every part of heaven hates and despises shame. Deep down in the fibers of God, there's a loathing for shame, a hatred, a warring, because shame keeps people away from Him, away from His presence, away from relationship with Him, away from eternal life, away from heaven. It hides, it pulls back. He hated the shame of Moses. He hated the shame of Abraham. He hated the shame of Samson when he sinned. He, sh he hated the shame of Israel. He wrote to them, I'm going to give you a, a covenant of circumcision you, and your shame will be removed. There'll be a cutting away and there will be no more shame. He hated the sin of Rahab. He hated the sin of Judas. He hated the shame of the woman at the well. He hated the shame of that Peter had from denying him three times. He hated the shame of the woman who was caught in adultery, and he hates the shame that held Paul, the apostle, back, and he hates the shame that holds you back. So what's the solution? All this leads up to a solution, and this is what really, really matters the most. The only way to heal from shame is to move the focus off ourself from what I'm not onto what? Who Christ is. I'm prophesying to you, friend. I'm telling you. The, the only way to remove shame is to take the focus off of what I'm not and put the focus on who Christ is, right? Whenever you're focused on yourself, you're going to come up short again 
and again and again? Well, here's the thought. If you think something bad about yourself, it may actually be partially true. I mean, right? There may be some truth to that. Anytime you think something bad about yourself, there might be some truth to that. So let me just kind of get in your business for a minute, for a minute, right? If you think, well, I'm a bad person, can I respectfully say, well, yeah, you kind of are. <laughs> You're a sinner and so am I. <laughs> I kind of am, right? Yeah, yeah. If you think I am, I'm in, in, inadequate, I can't even say the word. I'm inadequate to say the word inadequate. I'm inadequate. I'm, I'm inadequate. Guess what? Right again. <laughs> I'll never be good enough. Right again. No, you won't. You are not designed to do life on your own. You need help, and you are inadequate, and so am I. And some of you are like, well, I'm just uh, rude. And I'm like, well, some, some of you are just kind of rude. Just don't, don't be rude. <laughs> don't be rude, yeah? I'm pathetic. I just have bad news. Some of you kind of have some pathetic areas, you know? And, but here's the good news. This is the good news. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says this, not on the screen. This is what some of you were. That's what some of you were. It lists all these sins. And this is what some of you were. But you're washed. Come on. You're sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what you were, but this is what you are now. So it's a shift of focus between what's not true and what is true. What's consistent and what's inconsistent. That's why Jesus came. That's why he came. That's why he came. Joshua 5.9. I learned something this week that I did not know. I'm going to teach it to you. Joshua 5.9 says this. Then the Lord says to Joshua, Today I've rolled away from you the shame of Egypt. So the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. I've rolled away from you the shame of Egypt. So the name of this place will be called Gilgal to this day. So today I've rolled away. Your translation might say rolled away. It might say removed. Okay, so you get the picture, right? What we lose in translation from Hebrew <laughs> to English is that the word for removed or rolled away rhymes with the word for Gilgal. It was an intentional literary uh, 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 thing done. Rolled away, the Hebrew word rhymes with the Hebrew word for Gilgal. And notice it says, so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. So every time they said the word Gilgal, it rhymed with roll away. Every time they said the word Gilgal, it reminds with the Hebrew removed. Like the removing of a stone, a rolling of a stone away. The word rhymed with the truth that God had initiated because of his blood covenant that he'd rolled away. He'd rolled away the shame of Egypt. It's no longer on you, Israel. It's no longer, I've rolled it away. And every time you say the word Gilgal, the name of that place, where that happened, where that covenant was made, I want you to remember it's rolled away. Isn't that good? Isn't that cool? I didn't know that. I have good news for you today. God is in the business of rolling away the boulder of shame. He's in the business of removing the weight of shame and destroying shame, separating boulders in our lives. Shame does not have to be part of your story for one more day. It doesn't. So how does this happen?
Jesus had been arrested. Before he was arrested, he had a little powwow. We would know it as the Last Supper, right? And so, um, there's some back and forth. That's when Judas was exposed. He left to go do what he was going to do. And, and um, they're talking, you know, and, and there's Peter. He's chiming in because he's always the first one to speak and the second, or last one to, to think, right? He's just talking first. He's like, I'll never leave you, man. You, you, I'm, you're, I'm never, I'm, you hear me, Jesus? Listen, these jokers may bail out on you, but he says, safe in one instant, sift you, friend. Within 24 hours after that, Peter, three times over a campfire, denies even knowing who Jesus is. Jesus is arrested. He's taken to, uh, uh, I think, Caiaphas' house then, right? And so this little slave girl sees him and says, hey, weren't you with Jesus? He says, uh, the literal translation would be, no, to hell with you. It's what, the literal, no. He's cursing her out, right? No, I don't even know him. Three times he does that. So Jesus raises from the dead. Peter hears about it. He says, I've got to check this out myself. Can you imagine the guilt and shame that Peter felt? The very moment that he promised he would be there. And the one that you could say that Jesus needed his, his support right on the earth. He's fleeing. So the Bible says that Jesus appeared to the disciples while they were having prayer, I think, first time. Um, and he just appears in the middle of the room. They're like, oh, boy. Right? He does it again second time. A lot of commotion, a lot of things happening. And he says, look, I'm going go, go, go to Gal- I'm go to Galilee, right? I'm going there. I'm going to meet you guys there. So he appears to them. They're out fishing because they got to eat, right? They don't know what to do. They're back fishing. They're fishing all night. Hadn't caught anything. Jesus shows up and says, hey, have you guys caught anything? They're like, no, it's just this guy He's rubbing it in. No, he ain't caught nothing all night. He said, eh, move your nets over 20 feet. Put them on the other side of the boat. All right. The nets got so heavy they could hardly pull them in. Peter recognizes Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, I want to have breakfast with you. I'm going to cook you breakfast on the beach. As a matter of fact, you're all invited to breakfast on the beach Jesus is cooking. So he takes some of the fish they caught. He's cooking up the fish they caught. Now, they really had not had a lot of one-on-one intimate conversations. He's called out to Peter, right? This is in view of everybody. They're not hiding. It's not like Jesus says, hey, Peter, um, come over here. We need to talk need to talk. He doesn't do it that way. Everybody's there, right? He says, come and have breakfast with me. So he's not calling for a private meeting, not a private walk. As a matter of fact, John can hear what they're saying. He's recording it. Well, he does ultimately. So this is not a private conversation. And you, you, you know, like, I'm, th- I'm thinking, or the guys are probably thinking too, like, hey, hey Peter, um, I, I, I've got a, some questions for you. Because the last time we talked, you said, you know, oh, man, here it comes. We all know Peter. I mean, he's just kind of the spokesperson for nobody, for everybody who can't shut up. You know what I mean? He's just that guy. Uh, oh, man, here it comes. Here it comes. We, we, we all want to hear it. Peter, tell us exactly what happened, right? Why, why did you let me down at the most critical point of my life? Can you please, as a matter of fact, would you just explain it to everybody? Or, or, or maybe just, I mean, are you really sorry? 
none of that. That's not what happened. He looks at Peter and asks kind of the same question three different ways. And here's what he said in John 21. He says, um, they were finished eating. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you you love me more than these? I'm thinking, they're thinking, ooh, that was a (laughs) curveball. I didn't see that one coming. I mean, because we all know he deserved the talk, right? We all know he deserved. But I I just got a feeling that, that Jesus knew that Peter for several days had beat himself up over and over and over and over and over again, publicly, putting his foot face out there. I'm the man, I'm the man. And then he fails at the point of need. And Jesus did not feel the need to rehearse the past. He wanted to address today. And he says, do you love me? More than these? Not not, not more than this guy or that guy. More than all this. Am I more important than all this? All all your worldly possessions, all your goals, all your dreams. Am I important? Do you love me more than this? Or do you love this more than you love me? I I just want to establish a new kind of relationship with you, Peter. So the way that Jesus deal, deals with the shame is to give Peter a challenge. And, and, and Peter responds, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. So what does Jesus say? Be my lambs. Three different ways, pretty much the same thing. What, what I want to know is, do you love me more than all this? Listen, if yes, then I want you to be a leader in my church. If you love me more than all this, I, I want you to feed my sheep. That's what I want you to do. I, I want you to join my cause, right? I want you to join in with my mission to advance the kingdom of heaven. The Bible doesn't sweep Peter's mistakes under the rug. They are recorded in the history of the Word of God. But Jesus is saying, look, you're you're not going to be remembered as that guy three strikes you're out. What you're going to be remembered for is things like this. In a few days... I'm going to go, but I'm going to pour out my spirit, and you're going to stand up at the first church service of the, of the new covenant, and you're going to preach the gospel, Peter, and 3,000 people will get saved. That's what you'll be remembered for. You'll be remembered for uh, seeking me and finding me and have such powerful anointing that they'll line up people so that your, your shadows will cross the sidewalk and be healed. That's what you'll be remembered for. You don't won't be remembered for your failures and your shortcomings. Because if you love me more than all these, that will be erased. It'll be behind you. I'm going to set you free from that. And I got purpose for you. That's what he says to Peter. You're not going to be a failure. Can be a legend, man. People will look at your exploits and go, from that to that. If that could happen for him, it could happen for me. Do you love me more than these? Today we want to deal with guilt and shame right now. We want to deal with it right now. Guilt comes when I do something bad and I feel bad about it. Shame comes and says, because of your past, that's who you are. That's your label. You're that for life. And Jesus says, that's what some of you were. 
but if you love me more than these, if you love me more, that's not who you are. And every head bowed and every eye closed. We have prayed that the Holy Spirit would come and do surgery on us this morning. That the Holy Spirit would come and do surgery on our lives. If you're here today, <laughs> some of you have had things done to you that were zero fault of your own, that were not deserved, they were perpetuated, on, they, were, they were placed on you, it was violated, you were abused, you were taken advantage of, things have been done to you, and those things have caused shame in your life. And I'm here to tell you this is the last day of that kind of deal because Jesus has taken away every bit of shame. You, 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 listen, the cross is big enough for the sins of other people that have been perpetuated on us that we would even be healed of that. If you're here today and you are dealing with the guilt, or excuse me, the shame of things that have been done to you, I want you to know that Jesus is the healer. And he's come today to heal our brokenness. And if that's you, I want you to know he sees you in him as blameless and spotless and beautiful. He has healing for you. And I know some of it could be very complex, very deep, but he is able. Come on. Number two, some of you are here today, and as I'm talking about this, you're going, oh, wow. I'm kind of walking in some shame-based thinking. That's kind of what I've been doing. And I want that removed. I need help putting my focus not on myself, because when I do that, I go, oh, I missed the mark, I missed the mark. But on Jesus, the one who didn't miss the mark, the one who uh, despised the shame of the cross. He, he, just, he, he embraced, right? He said, oh, okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna let shame keep me back from fulfilling my purpose, right? And I'm definitely not gonna let shame keep you back from fulfilling your purpose. And he comes. And we build a relationship with him. And he says, put your eyes on me, the perfecter, Keep your eyes on me. There'll be times where you kind of stumble off to put your arm down, catch yourself, but don't, don't look down. Keep looking up. You, 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 you may trip over a pothole or stumble over. Get back. Keep your eyes on me. Don't, don't look to the left or right. Keep your eyes on me. And Jesus says, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. I'm the perfecter of your faith. I've come to remove all of that. And in me, <laughs> you are free. You are free. Every head bowed and eye closed. You say, Pastor Tim, one of those two areas is for me. Please pray for me. I'm not, listen, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Listen, we're, we're exposing shame as a lie from the devil. Come on. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be free from some shame in my life. I, I, I want to be done with it once and for all, done with it, done with it, done with it. That's what I want. The count of three, just wave at me. I want to be free from that. One, two, three. Across the room. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, man. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I want to be free. I want to be free. I, I know I've done some things that have made me guilty. 
I want to be free from the guilt of sin. Actually, I need Jesus to be my Lord. I need forgiveness. Anyone the sound of my voice, you say, I'm not even in relationship with God. I need to take the first step today, right now, to enter into relationship with God. And that's you on the count of three. You say, Tim, today's my day. Today I'm stepping over to the other side. Today I'm saying, I'm committing myself to Christ. I'm saying, listen, I do love Jesus more than all these. And that's you on the count of three. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to make that commitment today to surrender myself to Jesus fully. One, two, three. That's you just waiting to fully surrender my life to Jesus. Friend, he's taking care of everything. He's taking care of it all. He's taking care of it all. Father, I thank you that you have done um, the work necessary through your son Jesus to erase all guilt and all shame. You despise the shame of our sin. You, you loathe it. You, every fiber in your being despises. And you don't want us to hide. Where can we go to hide from you? Where can we go to hide from you? You see us anyways. Hiding from you really takes our eyes off of you. And so God, strengthen us by the power of your spirit. I pray for my brothers and sisters, my friends. He said, I just don't, I don't want to deal with that shame. That's, I don't need, I, that's, I know it's not from God. So I pray for a healing, a redirecting of mindsets. Ask the Lord to redirect your mind on it. God, redirect our mind on you. And any shame that's come because of things that have been done to us in the name of Jesus, Expose that lie and bring healing, I pray. Would everyone across the room together, would you stand? Stand all over the place. We're going to put our eyes on Jesus. We're going to sing. One of the best ways to put your eyes off of yourself and onto him is to worship. And we're going to do that right now. Our prayer team is going to come. And they're going to stand to the left and to the right. If you need prayer about anything we talked about, maybe you say, hey, I'm sick in body. Uh, I, I'd love to have some prayer for whatever. A prayer team, come. I, I, uh, or maybe I'm at a crisis point. I've got to make some decisions. I don't know. Or maybe you're like, hey, I've got some Christmas like gatherings, and it's kind of like creating some anxiety in me because there's conflict, and there's some shame, and there's some weird stuff, and I don't know. But whatever it is that you need prayer for, we're here to pray for you. We'd love to pray for you. Let's put our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. Come on, come on, and, and declare the truth of God's word over our life, the goodness of God. Amen? If you need prayer about this or anything, come on. Let's worship together. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me.
Lift your hands. Come on, just for a few moments. Yeah, come on, worship the king. Put your eyes on him. From the moment that I wake up. Isn't that good? Yes. Until I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God. Sing all my life. Declare it. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so Lord. And in darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Come on, declare his faithfulness right now. Come on. against you. He's prepared a table in the presence of your enemies. He has erased your sin as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers them no more. So God, give us your mind and your thoughts about ourselves. Don't let us be held back by shame anymore. And I speak a uh, uh, freedom over your people. God, for all those who say, yes, Jesus, I love you more than all this. God, a removing of everything that holds them back in the name of Jesus. God, you came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why you came, Jesus. And you came to destroy and expose shame. So I declare shame is lifted. Shame is removed. And all the weight of it is gone by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, 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 and amen. Come on, somebody. Do you receive that? Two things. I hope you'll be back tonight at 5 o'clock. But fellowship's important. Fellowship's important. It'll be a lot of fun. 5 o'clock. It starts at 5. So come a couple minutes early so I can eat all your snacks. Second thing is, on the way out, you'll notice some Christmas trees. On the right, as you exit, there's the angel tree. I want to say thank you for all those. I mean, you just responded. And what that is, is those represent families and kids who are going to, uh, their family's going to struggle this Christmas to provide Christmas. And so... Those are real people. They're not uh, um, like a number. They're a real person. Um, we, we know them. They're vetted, right? They're real needs. There's a few angels left. If you go by them, just check them out on the way out. There's instructions in how to, how to do that. And <clears throat> take a few moments to swing by the cafe. And look John and Joni Hires in the eye and tell them you love them and you appreciate them. Father, I pray blessing over your people. I pray strength over them. I pray endurance to run and not grow weary. And Lord, we just declare over ourselves, we are free from all critical spirits, all shame-based thinking, all being held from the things in our past, God. Liberate us to run with you to what you have for us in the future. In Jesus' name, And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you as you turn your connection cards. Have a great day.